Thank you, Donald. Well, yesterday, remember, a 29-year-old called Sally Carter from Birmingham drove a Ford Fiesta into the barriers outside Parliament. He's been picked up by the police and he's now a suspect in an investigation as to whether this was a terrorist act or not. Uh, I have to say, whether it was or whether it wasn't, it was pretty low grade, I am pleased to say. Um, of course, what the police are trying to find out now is who were his links and associations, and we know that three addresses in Birmingham have been raided by the police. I am one of those people who was warned for many, many years that unless we're very careful about who we let in, we face the risk, the increased risk, of terrorism. And yet yesterday, I thought, was a very, very low-grade offence. I was astonished to see streets closed, screens up around the car in Westminster, helicopters flying in the air. I thought the response, frankly, was a little bit OTT. But, of course, none of that will stop our elders, betters and leaders from suggesting that something must be done. Earlier on today, here was Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, discussing whether he thought, in response to this attack and others, Parliament Square should now be closed to traffic and pedestrianised. I've been a long-time advocate of part pedestrianising Parliament Square. There were plans, of course, in the past uh, from Ken Livingstone to part pedestrianise Parliament Square. Boris Johnson cancelled those uh, plans. It was in my manifesto to uh, bring these plans back on board. And actually what's accelerated my desire to do so is what we saw last March on Westminster Bridge. There's a group set up which involves the Palace Westminster, which involves Westminster Council, City Hall, but also the police and security experts, see how we can uh, part pedestrianise Parliament Square sooner rather than later, taking on board our concerns to make sure it doesn't look like a hostile environment. Well, there we are. Sadiq Khan, happy to stop the traffic outside Parliament, uh, to, as I see it, fly the white flag of surrender to terrorism. I'm not for it. And then the Met Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, well, she, she took a more measured approach, but still, I think you can hear from her tone of voice, she'd be perfectly happy to stop cars going round Parliament Square. As with anything, there is a balance to be drawn. Um, you know, vehicles are on our streets all the time. We have crowds on our streets as well. The terrorists want us to completely change our way of life. They want us to be afraid and they want us to stop doing what we want to do to, to lead a normal life in the UK. We're not going to give in. We're not going to just change our lifestyle. Um, but it is important that we take reasonable measures, as I think we have been doing over the last several months, to try to make sure that the most iconic sites, uh, including those in central London, are well protected. And should something happen there, that the police are able to respond very quickly uh, with armed officers, which is exactly what you saw yesterday. Well, the police responded with armed officers very quickly yesterday. That would have happened regardless whether it was pedestrianised or not. She took a more measured approach, but Sadiq Khan, uh, I mean, Frank, I'm sorry. This is pathetic. We don't give in. We don't push forward demands, in my opinion, to pedestrianise Parliament Square because some nut job drives a Ford Fiesta into the barriers outside Parliament. I'm not saying we shouldn't take precautions. And I, very interesting, you know, when I talked about uh, in the European elections of 14 and on, I talked about tough immigration controls. People said, oh, Nigel, really? We really need to build bridges, not walls. Well, actually, on many of our bridges in the city now, we've built walls on those bridges as precautions to stop pedestrians from simply running in and knocking people over. But I don't think we should give in too far. I think we need to, personally, I believe, we should be a lot more robust in standing up to terrorism and saying, two fingers up, we're not changing our way of life too much because of the likes of you. And I think that Sadiq Khan has given way too much today, and I wish the Met Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, had been firmer too. That is where I stand. I'm asking you, do you think pedestrianising Parliament Square is the right step forward for our safety, or is this, as I believe, giving in to terrorists? And if you think, no, no, Nigel, really, grow up. This just makes good practical sense. We have to do it. Call 0345 6060 973. Or if, like me, you think, why not fly the white flag over Parliament? Maybe even the ISIS one. Then text to 84850. And maybe you think, do you know what? 
we've got enough security measures in place in London already, including, you know, police with machine guns and things we wouldn't have even dreamt of five years ago. And that's how you feel. Tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, as ever, watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Would it be right in the light of what happened with a crazed madman driving a Ford Fiesta I mean, he could have chosen something bigger, couldn't he, really? Into those barriers and getting nowhere. Is it right for us to start changing the way central London operates? And folks, you may not live in London, but this principle applies to all of you as well, it seems to me. Let's go to Paul, who's a brand new caller, from Deal in Kent, my favourite town in the whole of England, Paul. How are you? I'm very, very well. It's lovely and sunny here as well. First time I've spoken to you, so it's a pleasure. No, I'm delighted. I have to say, I'm very jealous of you. I love Deal. It Kent is underrated in many ways. It's a lovely town. Well, it's the best, the best seaside town to live in the UK, by the way. And now you've got a pedestrianised High Street, of course, which won High Street of the Year um, three yeah. years ago, and I know it very well. Um, I know many of the establishments along that High Street. Um, uh, and I do understand there are arguments for pedestrianising, arguments that actually, you know, mums with kids, uh, you know, don't want the worry of traffic and the risk. And the, I get all that. But, Paul, would it really make sense to stop the traffic in Parliament Square after what happened yesterday? No, not at all. I'm really against it. And when I listened to um, Sadiq then, and on Good Morning Britain this morning... I think, it's a, I think there's, a, there's a hidden agenda there with that bloke. I mean, he's been trying to do this for years, and now he's got the ammunition to want to do it, and, and he's using the incident, which is pathetic, and I agree with you, um, in Parliament yesterday on Millbank, to fast-forward the pedestrianisation. And all you're going to do, I mean, it's a congested area already along Millbank, so now you're going to move the goalpost, put all the traffic onto Albert Embankment, having to use Lambeth and Westminster Bridge, make the traffic even worse in London, mm. which also mm. he is against. And, and you know, everyone's going around, everyone's banging that drum, Theresa May saying they will not win. Well, they've won. If you pedestrianise Parliament, they've won. And the do you, uh, Paul, there at the moment works. Paul, tell me, do you drive in London much? I'm a bus driver. <laughs> right, OK. Well, that answers my question, doesn't it? Uh, has, and I drive coaches in London as well. Has, in your view, the traffic got noticeably worse anyway in the last few years? 100%. Um, it, I mean, Sadiq Khan has done his best to try and stop tourism. Coach, I mean, I know we've digressed it, but Coach Park in London's become an absolute pain. There's not many spaces left to able to park. And taking a coach around London, whether you're a commuter coach or a tour coach... It just takes forever. And the minute that super highway came on the embankment... Oh, don't, was don't. A, ...was don't. a nail in its coffin. Paul, don't. I, you know, I go from Westminster to the city quite regularly. I can't get the underground because, you know, the sort of extremists would like to beat me up. So I have to go by car. It now takes me an hour to go yep. the three miles to the City of London because there's this huge cycle lane that no-one's in. But that's a different question, Paul, for a different evening. So for now... On this question, do you agree with me that this is pandering to terrorism? Absolutely, 100%. 100%. And Millbank's already been reduced in size to one lane each way. It has, yeah. And now, you know, and now making it completely, or the possibility to make it completely pedestrianised is just going to upset more Londoners. And, you know, a clever, to a clever terrorist, the one done yesterday was far from clever, yeah. what he was trying to achieve, God only knows. And then all this big swing and dance. But, oh, well, the police were there in minutes. But, well, but they would have been anyway. They're, they're, they're there anyway. They're there anyway exactly. with guns. Thank goodness. And after, what I, and after what happened last year, you know, with PC, with PC Palmer being stabbed, I'm not That's surprised. True. Paul, you're a star. Thank you very much. Singh says to me, Nigel, this is a white flag to terrorism. Nigel, apart from being clear, unconditional surrender, we will eventually need to pedestrianise all of London and perhaps the whole country, says Solomon, all the way from Jerusalem. Well, Solomon, I, I, I have to say, I, I, I really find Sadiq Khan's words unbelievable. But maybe Toby from Reading will put me straight. Good evening, Toby. Good evening to you, Nigel. Uh, no, I think on, on this occasion, it, it's one of few times I, I agree with Sadiq. Um, and okay. I think it's really, really pragmatic. And just think of it more as a, you know, you have a lawn, 
lots of people keep stepping onto it. I know this is far more serious, but you you just build a little little fence, a little picket fence. You can do it very tastefully. You can paint it green, white, whatever color you want. In this case, I think it's also good because there are so many tourists around there, and it's always chock a block. All right, okay, Toby, I get it. So, what about Buckingham Palace? Uh, yeah, so I I think the big landmarks. You, as I said, you can do this okay. tastefully. Fine. So, we, so we it. so we stop the traffic in Parliament Square. We agree. We stop the traffic at Buckingham Palace. What about Regent Street? <laughs> you know far more about London than well, I. Well, I do, Toby. I mean, all yeah. I'm saying to you is that if your argument is that we pedestrianise and make safer places with great London landmarks. My argument is to you, Toby, there are a lot of great London landmarks. Yes. So you, ha- you have to be selective. But, for example, um, you know, uh, Houses of Parliament, you have all, all the MPs and there's a lot of power that sits there. So I think there in particular, there's a very good argument for doing it. I don't think it's pandering to anyone. And, and just as an example, I mean, I used to go out of my house and not lock the door would be gone for hours nowadays i have to um, Mm. because things do change and i think more important than this is we need to look at why is it happening and how do we resolve those issues toby on the big picture i agree with you but as far as yesterday is concerned this was one nut job all right Uh, you know if this was a terrorist attack um, it was a pretty minor one i know one lady on a bicycle got very badly injured. I'm sorry about that. I'm not demeaning that. But surely, surely we're overreacting with the Mayor of London today calling for pedestrianisation. Sorry. Whoops. Hello? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I agree. But imagine if it had been a lorry, Nigel. Uh, yes, it could have been, and that's why, Toby, we've built barriers. That's why we've got precautions. That's why we've got armed policemen. Uh, look, I get the point. London needs to be safe, but I think this is a step too far. It's my view. Toby, I thank you for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 7.15. Surely we're not going to knee-jerk, because a 29-year-old who came to this country from Sudan, who was naturalised here, who clearly had something very badly wrong with him, drives a Ford Fiesta into the barriers outside the House of Lords, and the Mayor of London is saying, we need to pedestrianise Parliament Square. I mean, surely there's something pretty crazy about this. Surely this is the white flag of surrender. Why don't we stand firm? Tell me I'm wrong. 0345 973 Ted from Southend says, this is about protecting MPs, not the public. Take away the roads. How will the emergency services get there? Ted, they would, I think. Why should our politicians have more protection than the whole of the British people? It's quite a lot of this coming through. Who are these thick MPs that want to make Parliament Square pedestrian only? Do they think terrorists can't walk? Great tweet. Love it to death. So, They are proposing to move a problem from Parliament Square to somewhere else. What a great solution, says Paul in the West Midlands. And I get a green comment here. What about the environment? Think about the cleaner air in Parliament if it was pedestrianised. Well, you could just ban cars from London, I suppose. That'd make the whole thing much, much easier. Look, we're giving in, folks, here. You know, I know the threat of terrorism is there. Nobody has talked about it or warned about it more than me, you know, particularly since... Huge numbers of people came across the Mediterranean into Europe. It's one of the reasons I thought Brexit was the safer thing to do. But I think we're probably somewhat overreacting today. That is my view. What does Richard and Sidcup make of this great debate? Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. I think it's a, it's a terribly depressing situation when you've got a Mayor of London who's an advocate of open borders, who then wants to design the London architecture and landscape around the terrorism that, that's being too readily imported into this country. Um, it's it's going to completely change everything. Well, what's it going to look like in 10 years' time? As you say, what's going to happen if they start going into Whitehall, Buckingham Palace, parts of Oxford Street? What are we going to do? Oxford Street, the- Richard, Regent Street. I mean, a Piccadilly Circus. I mean, Leicester Square, where we are right now. I mean, all of these things, all of these things, you know, all of these images of London are iconic in their own way, aren't they? They are. They are, uh, Nigel. But unfortunately, it's not just London. If, if, you, if you look at the Eiffel Tower now, there's, there's bulletproof glass around, you know, not, not, not barriers for, to prevent cars smashing yeah, them. Yeah. Bulletproof 
glass around the Eiffel Tower. Is that right? Which, yeah, which, which, which has happened, which has happened in the last couple of years. So it's just, it just, it just seems to be that every sort of European iconic landmark now is being geared up and transformed into this awful barrier just to stand up or, or trying to resist this, this, this anticipated terrorist activity that they just haven't. We've, we've got Cressida Duke, who's absolutely useless. We've got a useless mayor. It's just they've got no... Well, these are your opinions, problem. Richard. But we do, I mean, you know, I suppose it's the job of the government uh, to protect us from terrorism, even though some would argue they've caused it. Well, a- absolutely. And you know what? The, the, the guy that sent the last text uh, text message into you with, with regard to the safety of the politicians, I quite like the idea of, of the MPs that, that, that have to walk out of those gates of Parliament and walk down the street like everybody else has to, and they can have that little sense of fear that they, they have to look over their shoulder because a lot, of, a lot of them have got such a ridiculous attitude towards what's going on in this country um, and, and who's being allowed in and who's, who's allowed to just simply just get away with this nonsense and preach it and support it and turn a blind eye to it. Sadiq Khan, really, he should, he, should, he should have a lot more focus on to who's doing this and what the security service... I know the security services are under a lot of pressure, but it's just there's just too much of it, and the solution isn't to change... Why don't we areas. deal... Why don't we deal with the problem, Richard, rather than, you know, let, let's, do, let's deal with the cause and not the symptom, maybe, is the answer. Richard, I have to tell you, most MPs walking out of Parliament into the street would have little to fear because no-one knows who any of them are anymore because they are a nondescript, dull, careerist bunch and they're on the whole there are exceptions pretty useless so thank you very much indeed for your call you said on lbc that you can't travel on the london underground because of your personal safety what kind of society have we become well i'm afraid that's been the case with me for four or five years um i think anybody that is high profile anybody that is famous has to think twice about what they do in public unfortunately folks and it's this is a separate debate but some of the left in this country believe not just that they are correct in their point of view, but those with a different, a different opinion should not only not be allowed to have it, but that they are evil. And that is where we have got to. And it's horrible, it's hateful, but hey, it's a different problem. Parliament Square is not being pedestrianised to protect me. Of that, I have no doubt. But is it not an overreaction from Sadiq Khan? I think it is. Anthony is a brand new caller from Camden. Good evening. Oh, hi, Nigel. Hi. So, is it sensible? Is Sadiq Khan, is he doing the practical thing, or is he just overreacting? I, I, I think it's absolutely practical. Um, as an ex-soldier myself, you, you need to target hard and you need to make sure that you're not exposing um, anything to to chance. So let's say um, let's say this guy that drove into these pedestrians. You know, let's say um, it wasn't just a vehicle he was driving; it was a vehicle packed with explosives. Yeah. You know, um, these are the things that we we need to think about. You know, and they're saying like, oh, and stuff like that. It's, I, it's, Anthony, I get that point. I get that point. But there are others way before you and I had this conversation that have thought about it as well. If you look at that huge barrier that the Ford Fiesta was crushed by yesterday, yeah. it is, I would guess, 40 yards at least from the entrance to the House of Lords. I mean, haven't we put, Anthony, haven't we put realistically enough protection in place already whilst at the same time trying to allow normal life to go on? Nigel, you can, you can never put enough protection in place. Unfortunately, we live in a nanny state, you know, and, and there's never... Well, I don't want to, Anthony. I don't want to live in a nanny state. I'm sick of the nanny state. Neither do I. If I'm sick of being told what I, I can and can't do and where I can go. I'm bored with it, Anthony. But, but I'm just saying, for instance, let's say this guy had, uh, for instance, like, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but a 50k explosive in, 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 this, um, in this vehicle he was driving. Yep. He drove off to the people, he hit them, and then he detonated it, you know? We're not, we're not talking about a couple of people being injured. But, Anthony, yeah, he could have done that. He could have done that a mile down the road. He could have done that well, two that, miles down the road. You've got, you got to trust in, um, in he, MI5 to make sure they're doing the job well. To I'll make tell sure you what, Anthony, uh, and I'm going to say this, and 
no doubt get absolutely muddled for saying so and slagged off for saying so. But had a 50k bomb gone off in that car yesterday, would it have caused death and destruction? Yes. Would it have significantly damaged the Palace of Westminster? No. You know, and those barriers are put up to protect an iconic landmark. Above all, that's what they're doing. When it comes to protecting human beings against suicide bombers, the truth of it is, Anthony, there isn't actually much we can do, is there? No, there's not that much we could do. But again, we need to protect um, that statement you just made. I, I actually hope you do get mullered, yeah, because um, human lives matter. But there's also one more thing. Uh, Anthony, I, I wasn't saying they don't, but I was arguing. I was arguing that if a terrorist wants to cause harm to human life, there are plenty of street markets, there are plenty of places in London within a mile or two miles of the Palace of Westminster where they could go and do it. Absolutely, but these people, they want to make a point. That's why they would choose Parliament. This is the, the foundation of democracy. So, Anthony, you know? if we... OK, all right, all right, OK. I'm, I'm, let me go with your thread of argument. All right? We don't want to take the risk of Parliament being severely damaged, right? So we pedestrianise Parliament Square. We then have to do the same, presumably, to Buckingham Palace, yeah? I assume, yes, I assume okay. so, yes. Yeah. OK. Um, Lambeth Palace, where the Archbishop of Canterbury lives? Well, I mean, Nigel, come on. Well, why not? It's a medieval it, castle. If, if, if it needs to be, if it needs to be done, then it needs to be done. That's why we've got a threat level, you know? So... If somewhere but Anthony, where does this? But, but Anthony, where? I mean, look, I understand the point you're making, but where would this? Where would it end? I mean, would we in the? Would we finish up banning all vehicles from London? Of all these people in this country that hates this country, you know, I'm originally from the Caribbean, and and, I'm, and it's totally off subject, but I, I don't get why. And this is personal to me. There are people who are naturalized in this country who they have no. No love, no bearing, no understanding, nothing like that of what it means to be British, you know. And coming from the Caribbean, I could actually say that, you know, the Queen or colonialism has shaped us to understand what being British is, you know. So I definitely don't get people who are not from the Commonwealth. So, Anthony, as, as somebody from the Caribbean who's become British, would you agree with me that, and it won't solve all of it, but one of the things we absolutely have to do is to make sure that people who are immigrants to this country can potentially become part of our society. 100%, absolutely. Absolutely. But they need to have the foundation in understanding what it means to become British. Yeah, no, uh, no and, and, that, and that would be dealing. That would be dealing, not with the symptom, but the cause. And with you, Anthony, with that, I'm 100% with you. Thank you. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC. It's now 7.30 in time for the news with Thomas Watts. Are we really going to pedestrianise Parliament Square because some nut job drives a full fiesta into the barriers outside the House of Lords? Well, Sadiq Khan seems to think so. Though, to be fair, he has argued that point for some years, and today made political points against Boris Johnson, who's always opposed it. I still feel it is an overreaction and not the right thing to say today. And actually, if we're going to stop cars driving around landmarks in London, I've got to tell you, folks, I travel around London by car every day. It's a nightmare already. Goodness knows what this would lead to. Before I get back to that, Gordon Brown, remember him? He was the Prime Minister of this country for some time. And he today has been at the Edinburgh International Book Festival and he was asked a question. Did he think Jeremy Corbyn was a fit and proper person to become the next Prime Minister? Now, bear in mind, the last two nights we've debated this very, very heavily. And Corbyn is in some trouble. He's in some trouble, not just because he went to the Palestinian Martyrs Cemetery, but because he kept changing his story and looking insincere. And what former PM Gordon Brown says is there is a problem with him, a Labour Party with anti-Semitism. And he says Jeremy Corbyn has got to change. He cannot sustain particularly what he is saying about the international agreement on what to do in our attitudes towards both the Holocaust and Israel. I predict to you that it's going to change within a few weeks, but I believe that even that change will not be enough. So the new hard left Labour Party is being deserted by virtually everybody from those successful governments, successful elections at least, in 97, 2001, and indeed 
in 2005. Right, are we going to pedestrianise Parliament Square? I think that would be flying the flag of surrender from Big Ben once it's finally uh, had all the scaffolding taken down from it. David says on Facebook, no, don't pedestrianise, get rid of the problem, don't bow to the terrorists, don't punish the public, punish the reasons behind it. Baron says, I'm sorry Nigel, but where is all the money coming from for all this security? I thought the NHS was still struggling for funds, or maybe I've missed something. Baron, you're right, uh, there are lots of priorities for government, of course there are, but the primary the primary role for government is to protect the integrity of the nation and its citizens. And I think, Baron, truth is, that becomes before absolutely everything else. And I genuinely believe that. If you think I'm wrong, call 0345 973 Scott says, what about stadiums, restaurants and public transport? How do we further protect them? Scott, I think the logical answer is we close everything down entirely in London, and perhaps then Birmingham and Manchester and Glasgow and Swansea and goodness knows where else. Angela is a new caller from Manchester. Good evening, Angela. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So do you, I mean, look, you know, you in that city last year suffered the most abominable uh, terrorist attack. It was truly uh, really shocking in every way. What happened yesterday was nowhere near, uh, thank goodness, that order. Do you think Sadiq Khan's response was proportionate or not? No, it was over the top. We should not pedestrianise London at all. And there's one thing I want to say is the police said is no, they had no knowledge of this chap from the Sudan. Uh, I no, I think, Angela, can I just correct you slightly? Uh, the intelligence services had no knowledge of him. He wasn't on the list of 23,000 people that they're worried about. But the police did have knowledge of him. I don't know how or why. I've got to be careful about this. But clearly, he's done something wrong at some point. Yes. Well, what I wanted to say was, mm -hmm. I'm a Conservative voter. Yeah. But this Conservative government has let those people back in that went to fight in Syria. Over 400 of them, yeah. Yes. They came back. Now... Does it take does it take um, a brain box for them to get somebody that isn't really well known to the intelligence services to do something like this, niggle away, niggle away? And I'm I'm finding that um, I have no faith left in this government. But Angela, if you, An Angela, let me just ask you this: If you're worried, and by the way, I find it unbelievable that cabinet ministers have sanctioned drone strikes on British citizens to kill them when they're in Syria, and yet the next day when they come back, that's absolutely fine and dandy, and I've discussed that many times on this show. But, Angela, would you feel more reassured with a Jeremy Corbyn government? No, because what's happening at the moment is the Labour, some, most of the Labour Party want to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. A lot of the Conservative Party want to get rid of Theresa May <laughs> because of all the splits. It's a right mess, they Angela, isn't it? They haven't got the courage to follow through with a true Brexit. But, so where does that leave us? Someone like Vince Cable to come in the middle? No. Angela, Angela, you're, you're, you're moving on from this issue to discussing the great political crisis. And by the way, tonight's not the night for that, but I do agree with you. I cannot think of any point in my lifetime when both the so-called major parties were in as much crisis with their own traditional voters. Angela, I thank you very much indeed for your call. I get on SMS, you can pedestrianise a whole city, but the terrorists will always find a way to terrorise. It will be a huge white flag. You won this one to the terrorists, says Catherine from South Wales. Catherine, I agree. I mean, look, you know, uh, Cressida Dick today said that the motor car had become the primary means of delivering terrorism, but hey, there are many, many other methods too. We must not fly the white flag of surrender. That's my view. What does Gerard, a new caller from Fulham, make of all this? Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Thanks a lot. I'm one of the 17.4 that voted to leave the bloated European Union, so I salute you. Thank yes, well, that's um, so. You're yeah. probably so. You were probably feeling quite depressed before the attack yesterday, then. 
Well, I believe one of the founding fathers, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, said that those who would give up uh, essential liberty to purchase a little uh, temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Uh, you... uh, talking of the white flag, you're, you're going to have a black flag flying there. Mm. Um, when you, I'm a licensed London taxi driver. I was yep. one of the longest taxi drivers to get his license in 1984. I was just 21 and a half, and I, I love my city. And, I, and it, it, I really weep when I see what uh, the subsequent mayor and the other ones have done to this city. Um, where he's going to get 300 million quid from to 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 then dig up the square and all the, all the uh, the traffic chaos? When he says he hasn't got enough money for police, what he should do. Instead of bowing down to these terrorists, because every time there is a, a terrorist attack, we get out the tea candles and put on Oasis, look back in anger and say, oh, I'm so sorry, these come from underprivileged places. Oh, yes, and do? we're all solidarity, Gerard. We're, we're all united together, aren't we? It's wonderful. And he keeps saying, you know, it's not going to change the British way of life. We've got to step up a lip. We're, well, I'm, I'll tell you, Mr Khan, Mr Hyden Sadiq Khan, because he only pops up when there's something really of any relevance going on. What you need to do is get out on the street and see what damage that you have done to the infrastructure on the roads. By sh- and he's now weaponising Oxford Street. He's gone back to Westminster Council today, of all days, when you know we don't even know who this bloke is, and ask them to then reconsider pedestrianising Oxford Street. You know, Gerald, Ger- what, what, what is amazing, 36 hours on from the attack, is actually how little we know about this guy. Exactly. And this is a knee-jerk reaction from Mr Khan. We've seen it before. He, he doesn't like not getting his own way. And he'll use anything. He'll weaponize this situation. It's terrible. But, yeah. you know, it's terrible what's happened. If, I'm sorry for the cyclists and people who got shot yes, of course. and everything else. Yes, of course. But you cannot, you cannot... Listen, my parents lived through the Second World War. My father, they're both dead now. They were telling me that... The Germans were dropping thousand pound bombs all over Chelsea and following. And, and life carried on. And we had the milkman. We had the milkman deliver the next day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely farcical that this man could could close uh, Trafal- uh, Parliament Square because it will lead up Whitehall, Trafalgar Square, Regent Street, Piccadilly. If you want, just put spikes in the road, Mister Khan, and have done it. <laughs> <laughs> you make the car, you make the cab driver, and, and it. And this bloke, this bloke will probably get less than what Tommy Robinson's going to get when he gets back. He'll have some, Gerard. He'll have some less wing lawyer on his side. Spoken like a true London black cab driver. Thank you for your call. You always get strong opinions from London. I believe you, because if, you know, whenever I get in them, they kind of know who I am. And uh, they always put me straight, I've got to tell you. Nigel, even if they pedestrianise the whole of London, it still would not stop a determined terrorist I get on SMS. And you're absolutely right. Much as it goes me to agree with you, I agree. If we pedestrianise Parliament Square, we're admitting defeat. However... We have already pedestrianised one side of Trafalgar Square, yep, not far from this building, and the Victoria Memorial without issue. So why not the same for Parliament Square? Neil, uh, there may be arguments, you know, safety arguments. I mean, the north end of Trafalgar Square, and by the way, getting round Trafalgar Square is now a nightmare, but I can sort of see with the National Gallery and huge numbers of pedestrians and street displays and demos in in Trafalgar Square, there may well have been a logical reason for closing that road. Uh, But my worry, Neil, is that this debate is happening in response to a pretty much failed terrorist attack. Seems to me the barriers and security that were put in place in Westminster worked not only was the Ford Fiesta crushed as it hit the barrier, but the armed response units were there within basically seconds. And you can't, however worried you are about the threats we face, you can't fundamentally change our whole way of life. Because if you do, Neil, then the terrorists actually have won. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC, and it's now 7.45. The Mayor of London wants to pedestrianise Parliament Square for fear of terrorist attacks, and the Chief of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick, does nothing to contradict that. I think we are flying a white flag. Some people think it could ultimately be the black flag of ISIS. I think we're giving in. I don't think we can afford to do this. If we do it in Parliament Square, it's Buckingham Palace next. It's it's Piccadilly Circus after that, and goodness knows what. That is my view. Chris is a brand new caller to this show. He lives in Cardiff. Good evening. Hello, Nigel. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Welcome. Um, yes, 
Uh, one question. Do you think Mayor Sadiq Khan is acting in the best interest of the citizens of London? Do you think he's a good man, a man of integrity? Uh, I think that Sadiq Khan is somebody who overreacts to situations who is always overtly political, hence his dig at Boris, uh, when he talked about this earlier on today. Um, and I think Sadiq Khan... Uh, Chris, I don't think he's a bad person, if that's what you're asking me. I've always actually got on with him personally rather well. Chris, I think he's plain wrong on this. I think he wants to fly a white flag, and that's a mistake. That's my view. OK, um, given the situation, the attacks that happened last year... And it was so easy for someone, as you term them, nut jobs, okay, for some, some person to drive a vehicle at speed into pedestrians. And today, do you know what? Today they were just lucky. They were lucky. And the, the response of the police was, you know, you know, it was absolutely top. But this could happen tomorrow, next week, next month. Um, what do you do? It's very tricky to call. Well, do you, um, yeah, but Chris, my point is, do you give in? I don't call it giving in. I call it reacting. Look at the situation in Northern Ireland, you know, where they had to protect police stations. I know it's not exactly the same, but these people, they, they, they go on the internet. These are vulnerable individuals, right, who, who, who receive this poison, and then they go out. Look at the guy from Cardiff last year who drove down and attacked the mosque. He was yep. an, a, a car. He was not an, an immigrant. He was a, a national, but he was, as you say, okay, it's crude to put it, but a nut job. He was a. a, a, a well, I mean, Chris, it, you know, it may well turn out, you know, when we get more information tomorrow, that Sally Cutter was, was a, you know, the suspect was a, you know, a huge a convert to radical Islamism, and that was his motivation, and, and some would say that was the likely case. But, but I just think, Chris, even though I've warned about this more than anybody, probably, about the risks of terrorism and the risks that were happening with the fracturing of our society, I just think the way we're behaving, Chris, today is an overreaction. I think we're in a very bad place, and I don't know what the answers are. But I would say, um, regarding the protection of Parliament, and, you know, that's the heart of democracy, look at that MP who came to the aid of the stab policeman yeah, last year. Yeah, I remember, to, you know, I remember. You know, um, we were in a very bad place, and I don't know what the answers well, are. Well, Parliament, Chris, crazy. Parliament was very, very weak. Um, and when that happened, you know, when the policeman was killed, uh, I mean, the truth of it was, the truth of it was, if Michael Fallon's, who was then Defence Secretary, personal close protection, had not had a gun, that guy could have got actually pretty close to the House of Commons chamber. So there were some pretty serious security lapses, Chris, I would argue that we have closed those gaps. And the worry, Chris, is this. If our parliament and our politicians are seen to be completely beyond our reach, because we've wrapped the whole of Westminster in cotton wool, Chris, my worry is that damages the whole democratic relationship between the governors and the governed, even more than it already is. It's a very hard thing to call. It's just very, very difficult. And we're in a very bad place. And 700 ongoing investigations. I know, I know, I know. Chris, I thought, you, Chris, yeah. you and I would agree with that. You know, 686 yeah. ongoing current investigations. Um, all we can do, Chris, it seems to me, is to resource our services to resource our intelligence people as much as we possibly can. Chris, thanks for the call. I'm going to move on. Others want to have a word. Stephen, who's calling from northwest London, wants to have a word. Stephen, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me on. So do we ban cars from London, Stephen? I mean, Sadiq Khan may take us there. No, no, uh, absolutely not. I mean, it's very hard to add to everything that's been said because the amount of sense that has been spoken on the on the program is, is incredible. Good. Um, I think what is interesting, this guy clearly had no hope with the, the, the sort of car he was driving. There were no arms in it. So the, the, really the Westminster was just the theatre or the, the, the stage, if you like, where he wanted this to happen. And he thought he'd take a few people out on the, on the way, if you like. 
Um, so, like you say, this could happen anywhere. Yes. Um, unfortunately, the only answer is, you know, it, it's the people that have allowed it to get to this state. They've had their time. They've had their chance. They failed miserably. Um, maybe they should start paying. Maybe Sadiq can start putting people returning from ISIS from the other countries. He can start putting them up in his house and paying, <laughs> them, looking after them. And everything. What I, I mean, isn't this, Stephen? Like <laughs> isn't this? I mean, Stephen, this. You know, and I've referred to this again and again and again over the last 20 months that I've LBC have accommodated me here. And I, and I keep on saying, how can it be? How can it be that our Labour and Conservative parties have allowed over 400 people who fought for ISIS in Syria back into our country? It, it's madness, Stephen, isn't it? Yeah, maybe there should be a tax on the people that are into them coming here in the first place, and they should pay a tax. Well, um, because if they're into it, then fine, you pay for it. You've got to get in the, Well, I, goodness only knows. So, Stephen, we don't pedestrianise Parliament Square, is that right? Don't pedestrianise. No, absolutely not. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Hang on, I got on Twitter. Even if it was a terrorist attack, the perpetrator did not get past the barrier. So, isn't that proof... The security in place is adequate, and so no need to pedestrianise, says Marty on Twitter. Marty, you've summed up beautifully some of the arguments I've been trying to make tonight. What's been put in place worked. That car came to stop a good 40 yards from the peers' entrance of the House of Lords. What was put in place worked, it seems to me, and we should not panic, and we should not overreact. James says don't pedestrianise as it would cause so much traffic getting around Parliament Square. Only cyclists would be allowed onto Parliament Square. Well, some mornings, James, it looks like there are any cyclists there anyway because such is the trend now to travel around London by bike. Not a trend that I've caught on to myself. Maybe Fred, a new caller from the City of London, has a view on bicycles versus cars. Fred, good evening. Uh, good evening. I Well, on bicycles versus cars, I think cars... Um, are with us and will always be with us to sit to stay. And uh, Sadiq is an enemy of cars. And, yes, um, isn't he? You know he is. And this is just another excuse to um, um, to ply his agenda. Uh, but on the matter of security, um, I don't believe we should be pedestrianizing Parliament Square. Um, getting really tired, actually, of people saying, like Chrisita Dick, saying we will not be cowed and our lifestyles are not going to change. These bollards and concrete blocks are not things of beauty. Historically, um, the best wall and the best security for England has been the English Channel. And well, that's certainly true. <laughs> Absolutely. We did our jobs right, and we've got good security uh, forces and everything. Um, so long as we had the will, um, we should... We should have a relatively easy time um, keeping bad guys out and uh, ferreting out and stopping the radicalization that's going on in the country. We're going to have to be quite robust, Fred, aren't we? Well, we will, but I think the important thing is to have the political will. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not so sure it's there. No, I think, Fred, you've, you know, and again, we've touched on this again and again in the last hour. We're too busy talking about the symptoms of the problem and not the cause. Fred, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Well, some strong, strong passions there. We should never change our ways. How weak would we look, says Ian. Ian, to some extent, just go through an airport. I will be tomorrow morning. We've already, to some extent, changed our ways. But a sense of perspective, please, and... Perhaps a rather sombre note to end on. Decorator Dave says, Here, Nigel, if you want to talk terrorist attacks, let's not forget the 20th anniversary of the 29 lives lost in the Omar bombing. Some of these feeble fiesta attacks pale into insignificance in comparison to what happened in Northern Ireland over many, many years. And I agree, Dave, we should not forget some of the abominable things that happened there within the United Kingdom. You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow.